Hello, and welcome to this lecture, in which I'll be presenting an example of aperture pattern synthesis. I'm Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. In a previous lecture, I went over the theory of aperture pattern synthesis. We used as input the normalized field pattern, which we've been calling capital F, which is a function of theta and phi, the pattern variables. And then given that input, we came up with a scheme for figuring out what the magnetic current distribution, m, x, and y, uh, in an aperture would need to be. So this is called the synthesis problem. We figure out, given a normalized field pattern, what equivalent currents we need in the aperture to realize that pattern. I also addressed the phased array application. Uh, in the phased array application, we don't have a continuous distribution of currents. We have discrete antennas. But then I pointed out that the difference really is not so great because you can represent a phased array by sampling a continuous current distribution. And as long as you satisfy the Nyquist criteria, uh, everything works out fine. In this lecture, I'll present an example of, of this technique. In this example, I'll use a phased array sector beam as the application. So I should say something about what a sector beam is. The application goes like this. Uh, sometimes, in some applications, you are interested in having roughly constant directivity over an angular region. So here's some angular region. And what you'd really like is to have uniform sensitivity over that entire angular region. And then because you know you can't avoid it, maybe you'll have some side lobes or something like that. So this is quite different from a simple beam forming scenario. In simple beam forming, what you do is you'd form a beam and it would have the greatest possible directivity and then that wouldn't cover the whole sector. So you'd have to form another beam, and then another beam, and then another beam. So in that scheme where you use simple beam forming, well, that requires multiple beams, which means you have to repeat hardware for each beam, or you have to repeat the software for each beam. And uh, this, can be, uh, this can turn out to be unacceptable, especially if the angular region is very large relative to the beam width of the simply formed beam. So the idea with a sector beam is with just one beam, you can cover the whole angular sector. So you need a scheme for deciding how to weight the elements so as to generate this, uh, this beam. And uh, that's the example we'll do here. So here's the problem statement for this particular example. The planar array will lie in the z equals zero plane as usual. So x, y, uh, the aperture, whatever shape it turns out to be, is in the x, y plane. I'll say here it's operating at 10 gigahertz. The only reason this frequency will become relevant in the problem is because I'll want to show you physical dimensions, like dimensions in meters. Uh, if I was content to show you everything in terms of wavelengths, I wouldn't have to specify a frequency. Now, another reason I use 10 gigahertz in particular is because this is a not uncommon frequency for phased array radars, for example. This frequency is in a band of frequencies known as X-band, and it's commonly used for these kinds of applications. The pattern should illuminate the following angular region as uniformly as possible. So in this coordinate system, we want to achieve roughly uniform directivity from theta ranging from 10 to 20 degrees and phi ranging from minus five to plus five degrees. So let me show you some pictures. I'll try to illustrate that a little bit more clearly. Here's X, here's Z. So uh, angles theta go this way. And so we're talking about roughly uniform directivity over the range uh, from 10 degrees to 20 degrees. To show this as phi, 
in the xy plane, what we're talking about is something that looks like this, where these angles are five degrees each. And then if I attempt to show this as a three-dimensional picture, which is going to be a bit tricky given my drawing skills, here's x and y, here's z, it's going to look something like this. Right, so the beam looks something like this. It's this patch of roughly uniform radius then defined by these angular regions here. So this is the sector beam that we would like to form. The illumination everywhere else I would like to be as small as possible. So nominally zero, in fact I'll specify that the normalized uh, pattern should be zero outside of this region that we've uh, identified. But we know that when we actually work the problem we're not going to be able to accomplish that, at least with a finite size aperture. We already know this from Fourier transform theory. And then we'll assume array elements are well modeled as Huygens sources. And I explained the Huygens source concept at some length in the previous lecture. Uh, but in general, this is going to be appropriate if we're talking about elements having low gain, linear polarization, balanced pattern, and so on. So. Uh, you can refer to the previous lecture for more details about what all that entails. Okay, so how do we find the current density? By the way, this is known as the synthesis problem. Well, uh, the way we do it is we use the expression that we derived in the previous lecture. So we said that the magnetic currents and the aperture, magnetic currents over X and Y, would be given by some constant M naught, which remember really isn't that important because we can normalize this however we want at the end and then some integral over the pattern variables, theta and phi, and generally we're gonna do this over the upper half space, also known as z greater than zero. And then here's a factor which is related to obliquity, and then here's the specified pattern And then here's a phase factor, which is really representing the Fourier transform aspect of this integral. And then here's differential solid angle. So if I substitute in now the specifics of this problem, well, M naught, I can just let be one. I could let be anything, but just to make it simple, I'll make it one. Uh, theta is going from 10 to 20 degrees. That's where the pattern function is non-zero. Phi is going from minus five to plus five degrees. That's where the pattern function is non-zero. And then here is the pattern function over that region, just one. Everything else here is the same. And now it's just a matter of computing this integral. Uh, to do that, here I'm going to compute this integral numerically. So nothing fancy. Uh, you just break this whole thing up into tiny little patches, uh, delta theta, delta phi, you integrate over those patches and um, for each point in the aperture. So for each point x and y, you're gonna compute this integral, right? And then you're going to move on to the next x and y and so on. So you have to repeat this integral for every point in the aperture. So this can be a little bit time consuming, although I'll tell you in the year 2016, this can be done in seconds on a laptop computer. So uh, that's not uh, the worry that it used to be decades ago, for example. So no problem to do this directly and numerically. Here's the result. Uh, for each point in the aperture plane, I have calculated m, x, y. So this is just a plot of m, x, y. This is the x direction. Up here is, this is the y direction. So the center of the surface here is the center of the aperture. And then I'm plotting the current density. I've normalized it so that the maximum value is zero dB. And then this color bar shows uh, the magnitudes. 
So 0 dB, minus 20 dB, minus 40 dB, and so on. And what you see should not be very surprising. You see, for example, through this cut, a pattern which is sink-like. If I try to draw a projection of it over here, it kind of looks like this. All right, so these, uh, the sink-like pattern is apparent. If you go in uh, the X dimension, you see it's a little bit more complicated. And that's because we asked for something a little bit more complicated in, in the pattern. I'll make one more point about this plot, and that's that you'll note that in order to get this detail, you have to achieve a certain grid spacing. So I discussed in the previous lecture how you should choose the grid spacing. And uh, if you do this exercise, you should be extra careful to make sure you've chosen an appropriate grid spacing. If you choose the grid spacing too small, you'll be wasting time. If you choose the grid spacing too large, then you will lose resolution. So if the grid size were, for example, like this, obviously you'd be losing some detail. Let me make one other comment about this uh, image before we move on. If I were to now to generate a phased array using this, uh, this result, what I would do is I would say, okay, I have elements here, 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 here. And then I'd just be sampling the distribution uh, and using those values as the weights of the uh, phased array. And then one final point is that you'll note that I just stopped at dimensions of plus or minus two and a half meters in this direction and then two and a half meters in this direction, right? This pattern doesn't stop. Uh, this aperture distribution doesn't stop there. It's just that's where I stopped computing it. In fact, you can see that if you enlarged this computation, if you kept going out to further and further points in the aperture, you would have non-zero values and in fact, this pattern goes forever. So we'll face at some point here the issue of how we would actually truncate this distribution so that it would fit in a finite aperture. And you can anticipate what kind of problems that might result in, and we'll show that. So now let's check the solution. This is known as analysis. So generating the solution with synthesis, this is analysis. Uh, in analysis, all we're going to do is take those magnetic currents and let them radiate. And you already know how to do that, so I don't have to explain the procedure for doing that. It's simply radiating magnetic currents. Now, as I noted in the previous slide, you really can't do this over the infinite extent of the z equals zero plane. You have to make a decision about where you're going to truncate this distribution. So I've chosen a five meter by five meter, or perhaps more usefully said, uh, 167 wavelength by a 167th wavelength array. So this is exactly what I've shown here. So when I do the analysis, I am literally using what's shown here, and I am literally assuming that anything not shown is zero. So that's the way I'm truncating this distribution. This is equivalent to saying that my phased array is five meters by five meters, in other words, 167 wavelengths by 167 wavelengths at 10 gigahertz. Uh, this is the phi equals zero uh, plane. Remember, in, in the phi equals zero plane, uh, we needed uniform directivity from theta equals 10 degrees to theta equals 20 degrees. And it looks like we got something close to that. And then the vertical axis is the magnitude of the electric field in dB, and I've normalized it to the maximum value, as we are often inclined to do. So it looks like it's working at least to some extent, right? In other words, from 10 to 20 degrees, where we said we wanted uniform directivity, we have a relatively large value, and that drops off quickly everywhere else. As we anticipated, it's certainly not zero outside of that range. And again, the fact that's not zero is simply due to the fact that the aperture has been truncated. We can zoom in on this result. So here's theta equals 10 degrees, here's theta equals 20 degrees, uh, and we can see in a little bit more detail what's happening. So in the phi equals zero plane, that's the red curve. We see that we have some ripple along here, 
the average value is actually maybe about minus one dB or so, and it's rippling by a tiny fraction of a dB around that number. And then just to show you that uh, I'm getting this in multiple planes, I've also plotted it at phi equals plus four. Remember, we specified uniform directivity up to phi equals plus five, so it should be about the same, and in fact it is. Now we have a name for this rippling effect. Uh, you probably know it from a previous course. This is known as Gibbs phenomenon. So this Gibbs phenomenon is a artifact of the truncation of the array. And then we see we have side lobes as expected. It doesn't just go to zero at the limits that we specified. And those side lobes, again, are representing the, the finite extent of the array. And you can imagine that we can do things to adjust these side lobes. We can apply taper, for example, that would adjust the side lobes. It would also change the directivity that we get up here. And we talked about all those trade-offs in a previous lecture. Here's a pattern cut that's perpendicular to what I just showed. So here we're in phi, rotating in phi, and this is for theta equals 15 degrees. So this is the perpendicular cut uh, through the pattern. And remember we specified that phi from minus five to plus five degrees, we wanted roughly uniform directivity. And it looks like we've accomplished that. In other words, it's roughly uniform directivity between minus five and plus five degrees. It drops off quickly thereafter. Here I'm zooming in and we see that, for example, through the center of the cut, it's again rippling around minus one dB or so with a ripple magnitude uh, on the order of a dB. And if we look at a slightly different cut where, again, the pattern should be uh, roughly constant, we see the same kind of thing, maybe with a slightly different uh, phase, if you will, in the ripple. So this is confirming that the scheme works as we uh, expected. In other words, we're getting uh, to a very good approximation what we specified, but the truncation of the aperture is resulting in some small variations. Now, are these important? Well, it depends on your application. Uh, can these be modified? Well, sure. You can apply tapers. You can make the aperture larger or smaller to affect these things. And that uh, brings you to the uh, the problem of iteration of the design. But you can see even the first attempt uh, is pretty close. Okay, so now some concluding remarks. We've raised some issues in this example, right? First, how to decide the aperture limits, right? Here we said uh, 167 wavelengths by 167 wavelengths, and then we ignored everything outside that region. Uh, we could alternatively make the aperture larger or smaller with effects that I think you can anticipate. We could taper the distribution to try to suppress side lobes, for example. The synthesized pattern has a directivity to it, right? In other words, once I synthesize the pattern, I can determine the directivity as I would could for any pattern once I know what it actually is. I mean, to be clear here, we've specified a pattern theta phi Right? We figured out what X and Y, were, what um, magnetic currents were in the aperture plane. Then we truncated them. Right? And then in the synthesis problem, we figured out what we actually got. Right? These two things are not the same. Right? In other words, this exhibited all the effects of truncation. So this has a different directivity than we originally specified. So what is that directivity? That's something we're going to address in a uh, follow-on lecture. Now, when I first introduced this whole topic of aperture pattern synthesis, I brought up the idea of simple beam forming, that is using progressive phase shifts. Uh, and you might ask, well, how does that fit in the scheme? What if I wanted to do something like simple beam forming in this scheme? Well, simple beam forming is simply requesting a normalized pattern, which is an impulse function. In other words, what we are requesting is f theta and phi is some delta function in theta, right? So 
we get um, zero everywhere other than theta equals zero, and at theta equals um, zero, well, we can't define it, but we know that when we integrate over the pattern, we get uh, a value of one. So this is what we're specifying if we want a broadside beam that has maximum directivity. And similarly, we can imagine requesting beams which are directed in some uh, other direction, like theta naught. And furthermore, you know that the inverse Fourier transform of a delta function is a constant magnitude function exhibiting the progressive phase shift. So for example, the inverse Fourier transform of this thing, well, that's just these currents being equal to one, right? And the inverse Fourier transform of this thing is something that has the magnitude equal to one, but the phase shifts are varying to result in this uh, beam pointing. So finally, let me make some comments on how you can use this example, uh, both to make sure you understand the concept and also in future work, maybe in future homework. First, you should try to recreate this result, uh, both the synthesis part and the analysis part. Now, two reasons for doing this. One is to make sure you understand the theory, but the other one is to make sure you can code this up properly, that you can write software that properly does this, uh, both parts, the synthesis and the analysis. If it turns out that you can't recreate my result, then uh, what I would suggest you do is see if you get the expected results for simple beam forming. And I just explained how you do that. Uh, you know, broadside pointing, off broadside pointing. For those simpler cases, the integration is much simpler. So you should be able to see what's, uh, what's going on that way, or at least it'll give you some troubleshooting tools that you can use to figure out what went wrong. This concludes this lecture in which I provide an example of aperture pattern synthesis.